the Black Sea. It has been a source of amazement, awe, and mystery from the very beginnings of recorded time. Some experts theorize that the infilling of the Black Sea, which began when the Ice Age ended, was actually the flooding mentioned in the Bible during the time of Noah. Other scientists take into consideration ancient Greek historical recollections of global scale flooding. Then, as it was written on ancient Greek papyrus scrolls, the Black Sea seemed to swell ever higher with each passing year. Those ancient scribes reported how this rapid ocean's rising occurred during the reigns of several prominent Greek kings. One of them, Dardanus, after whom the region's Dardanelles Strait was named, and another, Cecrops, were both mentioned in passages penned by Plato. He concluded that these kings were alive to witness the world's oceans rising to consume much of Greece, creating some now submerged offshore islands. A few generations later, by the end of the Bronze Age, Jason the Explorer, who claimed to have sailed the entire length of the Black Sea, had differing accounts of what was seen over their pitching decks. Furthermore, elaborate myths and fanciful fables, along with colorful sailors' lore of what dangers lie beneath the surface of the Black Sea, have always abounded. Teams of modern-day scientists from the Ukraine, Russia, Bulgaria, England, and America are sorting out the amazing truth. Supposition and first-person reports of significant discoveries seemingly exist side by side. Mystery swirls about the history of the Black Sea, a vortex of uncertainty throughout every century onward from prehistory to today. All of the newest evidence and developments, all centering around the baffling, unfathomable origins of this eternally changing body of water, the enigma that is the Black Sea, are only now being brought to light here in this documentary. Scientists have tried, through the years, to determine the actual origin of the Black Sea. They hypothesize that meltwater from the end of the Ice Age likely raised sea levels by a few hundred meters. This caused the seawater to gradually rise, flooding in to form a river valley, then pouring out inland as a freshwater lake. Not surprisingly, there is evidence of some long-lost civilizations on the now-submerged shoreline of the Old Black Sea. Some other sites are occasionally visible at low tide conditions below the surface near the breakwater. And what about the unusual, often poisonous, chemical reactions and strange otherworldly physical properties of the Black Sea? Do they exist today merely to give us an indication of the Ice Age environment? These and other issues will be explored here, perhaps to discover if the scientists who called it the northern cradle of civilization are really onto something. Modern day researchers in Russia call the Old Black Sea shoreline, 100 meters underwater, the Cimmerian shoreline. It used to be the water's edge of that vast inland lake during the Ice Age, and there is ample evidence that the entire shoreline became suddenly submerged completely sunken underwater rather rapidly, astonishingly, within perhaps just 30 years. On our 1983 expeditions, you know, we were astonished, not only us, our Russian colleagues, because the dunes that we could see in the reflection profiles were absolutely pristine. There was no evidence of any sculpting, any washing, any eroding, any beveling of the dunes. So a sand dune exposed to the washing of waves and surf, surf as it would gradually drown by a slow transgressing sea would no longer be there or it'd be heavily eroded. The amazing thing is the Black Sea coastal dunes are as pristine as they were the day before the flood. The paleo shoreline of the Old Black Sea, which averages about 100 meters deep, is pristine. It was covered rapidly because the berms of beach sand dunes, the paleo river valleys, the estuaries at the mouths of the paleo river valleys, uh, 100 meters deep in the Black Sea were covered over rapidly with muds and sands, so there was no erosion gradually as the Black Sea slowly filled. It filled relatively rapidly within a matter of decades, and many scientists are coming around to uh, seeing this scenario. 
probably among them is uh, William Ryan at Columbia, who hypothesized a filling within only a few years. But according to my research, it's looking more like it infilled uh, within uh, two, three, four decades. The evidence that the old Black Sea infilled rapidly is the simultaneous appearance of marine sediments on top of lake bed sediments everywhere across its submerged margins. And we dated the first shells, the first marine shells to colonize that new underwater world. And to our astonishment, the dates from carbon-14 measurements were identical of all the shells that sat on that horizon in all the cores along the transect. Several years ago, in the process of laying an oil pipeline across the Black Sea to Turkey, Russian scientists simultaneously conducted a detailed survey map. On it, they reported that the same type of shells were found along the Caucasus margins. Additionally, they noted the presence of sand dune fields in the area. French teams have also mapped these strange sand dunes stretching all the way down from the Armenian outer shelf to beyond, under the Bulgarian ridge. After the flood, after the global ocean reconnected with the Mediterranean, the Black Sea became saltier and saltier and saltier. Within a very short time, 10, 20, 50, 100 years, 50 years, the sh marine shells, the marine clams and mussels could all uh, inhabit the, the, the Black Sea seabed. And they completely replaced the freshwater shells. We can look today and with reflection profiling in the Bosphorus Straits, image we call bedrock, the old hard uh, bedrock at a depth of about 75 meters. But this uh, bedrock itself was eroded by the waters coming through the strait when it broke open the, the gateway. Now some have hypothesized, such as William Ryan, that around 5000 BC it broke through and poured in rapidly over a ledge like 50 Niagara Falls. However, the debris that we see at the north end of the Bosporus, where the Bosporus enters the Black Sea currently, we see modest sized boulders, pebbles, cobbles with mud over such. So this suggests a gradual infill, a gradual overflow as the world ocean gradually rose. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a matter of a meter or two per year with no precipitous drop off like that Niagara Falls, but a gradual rising, a gradual rising and connecting with the old Black Sea and then gradual subsequent infilling until the Black Sea approximated its current shoreline level several centuries later. So the, the breakthrough spewed out this debris and then the, the, when that flood ended and the waters rapidly rose, the Mediterranean water continued to flow into the Black Sea as it does today. Because it's salty, it's heavier, it sort of falls into the Black Sea under the, the Black Sea fresher outflow and that, that has put a cover a blanket over this old fan and actually put mud waves. You can see migrating mud waves uh, that uh, represent that. In fact, uh, that's this, this map up here is uh, those stripes, those are the mud waves that, uh, that sit on top of this old uh, this debris fan. Well, the huge amount of water port to the Black Sea Basin, it uh, broke the isostatic balance of the Earth's crest in, in this area, and uh, isostasy had to restore this balance. But the way it was been restored was uh, depending on physical properties of the earth crust at every specific area. Where it was more flexible, it just distorted. But uh, where it wasn't flexible, but there was a uh, rock monoliths like limestone monoliths in the area of modern Yalta. It cannot be just uh, distorted flexibly and uh, broke and uh, cause the uh, block faults which we can see around. So we see that it was different way in different areas of the uh, modern Black Sea shore. It's 
survey that was carried out by the French scientist Gilles Lercole uh, invited me aboard. Uh, uh, reflection profiling back and forth across the Romanian shelf, a little bit up on the Ukraine shelf, found out in the outer shelf some faults where the seafloor had been modestly uh, offset down, 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 the further you go seaward. The faults that we mapped were in the range of a fraction of a meter to a few meters of offset, and they clearly offset the old terrestrial terrain, but they offset the seafloor by a less magnitude, so we would infer that they have been somewhat continuously active or intermittently active since the flooding. After the huge amounts of water poured to the Black Sea Basin from the uh, ocean, the weight of all this amount of the water uh, uh, changed the isostatic balance of the Earth crest. And uh, so the basin had to uh, distort as a result. And the, in the places where this distortion was soft, it just gone down uh, softly. But uh, when there was a monolite blocks like Crimean mountains, limestone monolites, it's actually broken and made the great flock falls that we can observe at the south southern coast of Crimea, like area of, of Yalta. When the water of the world ocean infilled and poured over the Bosporus Strait, all that volume, all that mass of water pushed down on the crust at the bottom of the Black Sea. So it pushed down and there became vertical block faulting as a result. And this is because the great weight when the world ocean water poured through the Bosporus, the world ocean rose, it eventually poured into the Black Sea region, increasing its depth rapidly and this mass pushed down on the crust of the earth and caused this vertical faulting, like stair steps down. And it happened to a greater degree in the southeast area of the Black Sea and to a lesser degree in the north and northwest sectors. The, the main uh, effect of the filling in the Black Sea basin with salted water of the world ocean is a killing of the waste uh, vegetation of this area which produced a lot of uh, hydrogen sulfate and the uh, Black Sea Basin is filled with uh, uh, hydrogen sulfate by now. It's still turned uh, metal into the black, which uh, is the reason the sea is called black. And uh, from time to time, especially during the earthquakes, some amounts of hydrogen sulfate comes to the surface and inflammates and we see the uh, uh, like a, uh, and sometimes people can observe very interesting effect of the flaming of the sea. We surveyed across one of these faults that offsets the seafloor, and uh, there was evidence of little gas bubbles coming up out of the fault scarp. Nikolai Panin told me that uh, in the 1920s there had been an earthquake offshore and the whole sky at night offshore had lit up red and the fishing fleet never returned and that the shaking of the ground must have released vast amounts of methane which then caught fire in somebody's smokestack and the sea surface ignited Many scientists claim that the immense inland lake known as the Old Black Sea was brought into contact with the then rising world ocean around 6000 BC, according to carbon-14 dating of submerged organic material. However, many other scientists now believe that carbon-14 dating results are less reliable when dealing with water-drenched samples from that far back into antiquity. Well, uh, carbon dating method in general is quite questionable. Even Libby, who got the Nobel Prize for it, understands that uh, 2,000 years is the maximum for its uh, 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 application without too much presuppositions. And involves uh, presupposition, and the major presupposition it has is that amount of carbon-14 and carbon-12 was always the same in our atmosphere. But we know that they are not in balance even by now, and in former times uh, this disbalance was even bigger. So I would be very careful with the carbon dating data.
If there was much more volcanism back in the time of, say, the Exodus, when uh, Santorini exploded, and there were, Mount Etna was going off as well from historical records. So the carbon dioxide from all these volcanics going on at those times would have greatly diluted the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere by the carbon-12, which is in the carbon dioxide, which is within the gases which are emitted from these volcanoes, which are documented to have been going off around 1500 BC and earlier. So with the rampant volcanism, also mentioned uh, from ancient Turkish literature, as the volcanics going off in the Caucasus Mountain of the northern uh, Turkey region at the time of Sargon the Great, the great Assyrian king at around 2000 BC. Legend about him says rampant volcanics in Turkey as well. So Santorini, Etna, Turkey, all these volcanics going off. That diluted the carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Therefore, the results we get from that time frame are greatly exaggerated. The ancient Thracians lived on the western shore of the Black Sea, where Bulgaria is today. Nowadays, submerged offshore, you can find Bronze Age ruins and artifacts, and some pieces which indicate that there were people who lived at this site even earlier, during the Ice Age. Evidence that proves the existence of a massive inland lake, one whose shoreline is now about 100 meters beneath the water's surface. Regarding the river called Pravadiska, it is a river that feeds the Black Sea, presumed to be about 60 kilometers from the ancient shoreline, and it has a depth of 90 to 120 meters from the old shoreline to the current one after the post Ice Age flooding. It was once a very beautiful river system, and it's likely that ancient people lived along the banks of the old river. We have found traces of an ancient village, now submerged there, and in this respect, the Noah's plate that we are going to show you now was discovered from there at the depth of about 100 meters. It seems the environment and the beauty of the nature near the river were very special to the people who lived there. The Paleo River Delta at the mouth of the Provodskia River in uh, Bulgaria is at 90 meters of water, about 40 kilometers offshore at the old Paleo shoreline of the Old Black Sea. When the Old Black Sea was a freshwater lake, the outflow of which went down where the Bosporus is now. It was a river that went down to the Aegean Sea, which was lower during the Ice Age. So the sea level rose, it poured into the Black Sea eventually, and covered up these river deltas, which are now anywhere averaging around 100 meters deep. And this Provid Sky or River Valley, where, where relics, ancient Thracian relics, have been discovered, is in pristine condition. Once again, demonstrating that the Black Sea overflow was relatively rapid. The plate of Noah has been discovered during one expedition back in 1985 on July 16. We had been searching for ancient villages in the area near the old pre-flood shores of the old Black Sea. Some of these ancient villages had been discovered, such as the one called Necropole, and the place where the Noah's plate artifact had been found. It has been extracted and excavated using a mechanical hand tool from the Russian submarine Argus. And because it was found in the Black Sea area, where the flood of Genesis was presumed to have occurred, the plate was given the name Noah's Plate. It is formed very elegantly and symmetrically of sandstone. We must presume that the plate was made by the ancient inhabitants who dwelled in the area. Bob Ballard's uh, extraordinary expedition off Sinope and his widely acclaimed discovery of evidence of human habitation at depths of 90 and more meters below today's level uh, has raised lots of fascinating questions. When he first heard the news, we said, all right, that's it. Clearly it was a Black Sea flood burying these old settlements. Now, Fred Hebert, uh, an uh, archaeologist uh, who sampled the, the sediments uh, in the, uh, told me personally that there are high levels of acids and so in those soils that suggest the presence of corrals with animals in them because of and high urine contents. 
Herodotus said the Sumerians or the Cimmerians lived all along the northern shore of the Black Sea. He said that entire region uh, was settled by the Cimmerians. And remember too that the old Paleo shoreline is called the Cimmerian shoreline by the Russian geologists. So they at least indirectly or subconsciously are thinking that yes, that was the old Black Sea of freshwater lake when the Cimmerians were living there, as Herodotus said such. So here we have an interesting contradiction within the mainstream scientific thought process that the Ice Age actually ended millennia before the Cimmerians existed, whereas they seem to also realize that yeah, it may, the Black Sea may have been filled much later than a lot of people think. And this in fact is evidence with Bronze Age sites, evidence of Bronze Age sites on this Paleo shoreline. Now one of the astonishing things we find in the Black Sea are old Bronze Age harbors, their pilings, deep beneath today's sea surface at depths much deeper than the harbors of the similar age in the Aegean Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. And this has been a puzzle. It is very hard to speak about submerged ruins here at the shore of Crimea, first of all because of a huge block fault which uh, uh, should destroy most of the ancient shoreline. And uh, most of settlements we know now at the shoreline, which are submerged, belong to 4th century BC only. So the ancient Sumerian uh, sites should be uh, on the much uh, bigger depth. And if I would be an archaeologist, I would study the Herodotus description of the area and follow the beds and river deltas. Because uh, during the uh, raising of the water in the See, uh, people had to step back, move back uh, by the river deltas and uh, most of uh, modern towns and ancient cities are at the river mouths. So the most ancient ones that are submerged now should be at the ancient river mouth. Certainly in the Ice Age, people were using bones, they were using ivory, they were using them as spears, they were using them to hold their clothes together. They were also using them as uh, ornaments, as decorations, as jewellery, and as fairly sophisticated things. Mammoth bones were also used, for example, to hold together skins on the outside of um, people's dwellings at some point. So there was an extensive um, tool use of Ice Age animals, um, their bones, their animals, plus their tusks at that time. And in Crimea, uh, it was a really big diversity of fauna, but mainly it was the fauna of the step for a step character. So it is the uh, Echos gidrontinus, small horses, Saigata tarica, small antelope, and as well as mammoths, and sometimes we have the um, animals which migrated from the northern territories. The, the main species was uh, also horses, but another type of horses, uh, Echus latipus. These horses was adopted for the soft and uh, humid, uh, soft uh, surfaces and humid places. And uh, mammoths was one of them main hunted species in the northern part of the uh, Eastern Europe. They only collected the bones of mammoths to produce their fireplaces. The mastodons, another Ice Age animal, which ostensibly should have gone extinct also when the Ice Age ostensibly ended at 10,000 BC, they are known to have existed up until 2000 BC. So this suggests that in fact the Ice Age and the Ice Age conditions were ongoing on up and into the Bronze Age. There's no getting around this. We have animal tools, bones from Bronze Age people of mammoths. Mammoth bones were used to build fireplaces, to make tools that Bronze Age people used. So the Ice Age in fact ended much later than is popularly advertised. We know two types of elephants today, the Asian and the African elephants, but of course they're 
just the end of a long lineage of about 30 different species, perhaps the most charismatic of which were the mammoths and the mastodons, huge beasts, and maybe sort of uh, three, well, certainly about up to about four or five meters at the shoulder and covered with immense strands of hair. And of course, we know a lot about these animals because um, their bones, their skin, their hair has remained intact in some of the sort of perma ice in which they live. Indeed, uh, mammoths probably existed until historical times with um, the last populations dying out in islands off Siberia and Russia about 4,000 years ago. So around the Black Sea during the Ice Age, there was three to four times the amount of rain there is today. Rather than arid steppes with little vegetation and few trees, it was rich pasture lands, thick, dense primeval forests, uh, rainfall 50 inches a year rather than 10 inches a year or 100 centimeters per year. Four times what they have today. So it's a completely different world. The rivers were twice as wide as they are today in the Black Sea region. Huge amounts of rainfall. So it's a completely different world at that time with completely different flora and fauna. Of course there were lots of predators around from predators we know today like arctic fox and wolves to animals who have modern relations but these guys were bigger cave bear cave lions for example possibly about the size of um, a modern horse at the shoulder a very very sort of stocky animal that could take down the huge um, giant deer or um, the aurochs the, the, the wild cattle cave hyena as well existed and many of these things were hunted out by people but possibly their populations became smaller first as a result of climate change. Cave lions persisted until about 2,000 years ago in places like Kazakhstan in Central Asia for example. Uh, during the ice age in the northern Europe climate here was much more mild, it was cool, it was uh, twice as much of precipitation than we have now, with a lot of snows during the winter and not a lot of rains during the summer. And definitely the flora and fauna of the uh, region was completely different, which we know from the archaeological data. So they were the forest hunters. So as usual, the dwellings was, uh, first of all, they made the pit and then some kind of construction on the pit. Uh, how big was the construction above the pit, nobody knows. Uh, but we have some traces of the sticks around the pit and it means it was the structure I know uh, which have the present day analogy of chum. Uh, in Chukotka style or Eskimo or wigwam of the Northern American Indians, a forest kind of wigwam. And uh, usually they have the hearse, fireplace in the middle. And uh, sometimes in one case, at least we find the burial in it. The world that consists of animals, these are the horses, and it is known that uh, it was the Khmerians that learned to ride horses. You can see the armor, and it uh, shows us that uh, it was the warrior ancestor. The, the advanced tooling of the ancient Thracians, the Scythians, and the Khmerians, ornaments and jewelry have been found with um, fantastic precision. The tooling skills were spectacular. And also, uh, people have heard of the Antikythera device, which was made out of brass with, 10, with 50 to 70 gears in it, finely toothed gears working interconnectedly. Their tooling capabilities were spectacular, as witnessed with the jewelry and, and whatnot, which have been discovered with these ancient Thracians. They had much wherewithal from the tooling skill. Well, geometric patterns of long bone tools uh, usually is connected with Gorodzovskaya culture in the mid dome. Uh, they never been in Crimea. Uh, but uh, they have very impressive bone technologies. Uh, some of them uh, was made from mammoth bone, uh, long bones, and looks like the shovels. 
Uh, the another was the pendants made from a different kind of bones of birds, as well as the pendants made from mammoth ivory. Uh, geometric patterns are usual for that time. It's uh, rounded with a hole in it. That's all. So they use it like a knuckle, something like this. Very rare are found of jewelry in this uh, in burial mounds, but uh, it, it was sometimes a silver, silver plates, silver spirals, um, medallions, amulets, maybe we don't know, with the rings and crosses on it. Pottery is the only one reliable way of age dating. All the rest, uh, like tools, uh, usage of the metal or flint, it is a cultural issue. And uh, at the same time, different cultures can live in one area. Like today in Australia, you can find the nuclear missiles and uh, aborigines with the flint tools at the same time. And uh, definitely in area where there is no sources of copper, Copper tools are much more expensive, that is why people are more careful with them and most of sites uh, which are found here doesn't have metal. There are hundreds of sites here with flint tools and only a dozen with copper tools. This is a huge problem for archaeologists uh, who follow uh, traditional uh, progress idea that everyone who was older used only flint tools, everyone who are younger uh, culture, all cultures at Yange use metal tools, but all the sites could belong to the same period is just sites of more uh, prosperous and uh, more poor people, that, that is why they had different tools. The most surprising uh, find of our excavations was a bronze axe. On, uh, for catacomb culture, uh, on a 2000 burial, uh, burial mounds, uh, burials, was just four uh, bronze axes, and one of them is in our university museum. We found uh, ancient copper mines uh, near near town Popasne. It's uh, 30 kilometers far from Kurgan, we were, we were today, and uh, there were different type of mines. Uh, they uh, collected uh, copper ore, and uh, they work with it and made uh, tools. Bronze and bronze tools. All style of Kurgan is a, a stair style when we can see that the bricks have a, st a stair construction. In 19th century, this uh, stair is called uh, Egyptian arches. These burial shrines, known as Kurgans, are thought by many to have been built during the Bronze Age. This is the time when the Cimmerians were assembling fortifications with these types of megalithic blocks. The Mycenaeans of Greece, circa 2000 BC, were building citadels with sculpted megalithic blocks. It's obvious to see that the climate there was much different than it is today. Yes, it's interesting uh, in Argonautica, the story about Jason the Argonauts, when Jason the Argonauts sailed uh, up through the Dardanelles and the Bosporus, they mentioned the Bithynians, or the people of Bithynia. And Bithynia was one of the 10 or 12 most ancient tribes of the Thracians. And the Thracians' namesake is Tyros. A, guy, a fellow named Tyros, and that became the name Thracian. There were 10 tribes under them. Bithynia was one of them. They lived in the area of Troy. Now, Dori is another tribe of the Thracians. Now, we've all heard of the Dorians, the Dorian invasion, the Greek Dorians who invaded from the north and took over the Peloponnesus around 2000 BC. These, in reality, were Thracians, the people of Dori, which was a southern province of the Thracian kingdom. So the Dorian Greeks, in reality, were Thracians, the offspring of this man named Tyros. In this hall, I uh, show the artifacts from the early Bronze Age settlements from the area of the Varna and Bilusaf lakes. 
the vessel from uh, clay, a stone artifact, and uh, this is stone tools, and uh, these pieces from wood are from the housing structure of these submerged early Bronze Age uh, settlements. Very, have a very similar culture with uh, Eastern Mediterranean cultures, for example, in Oz, in Anatolia, on Phoenician coast, it's in Near East, you know. These pottery vessels are very interesting. They are typical Trashans for the eastern part of the Balkan Peninsula. And they are similar to the clay pottery uh, with eastern of the west, eastern part of the Mediterranean and they are chronologically um, very close to the Troy. Значи, говоряки за тракийската култура, която е унаследила черноморската култура. Considering that Thracian culture allegedly inherited Black Sea culture, we can then assume that the ancient were navigators, primarily because of the direct evidence we found, such as one piece wooden boats. Also sailing vessels were depicted by using drawings on rocks. One of them was a ship complete with mast and sails. Uh, искам да кажа, че... Thracians have been assumed to be the originators of many cultures. Before we start talking about the links between the ancient Thracians and ancient Egyptians, we must point out the links with the Phoenicians. The well-known regions of Troy has ties to the Thracians too. It would be almost impossible for them not to have been linked with the early Egyptians by ancient ocean navigators. For instance, the main suppliers of wheat to the ancient Greeks were Thracians. True, the cultural heritage of the ancient Thracian people is very interesting because they were merchants, suppliers and traders with people in other parts of the world by their navigation. They did trade with Aegean sea villages such as Troy. Up to now we have found two single piece wood boats dated 15th, 16th century BC. It speaks for well-developed sailing and maritime skills as far back as 3,500 years ago and must have originated well before that time. All this evidence and proof can point out attention to give us circumstantial, indirect evidence for the ways that ancient nation has contact with the other nations. Somehow, some way, these people made contact with other cultures, probably by sea. Here is a point in time where we can say that this ancient civilization was sailors, just like the Greeks were. Because of similarities of most ancient necropolis ruins at the site of Duran Kulak, we can assume the following, that the houses were built with stone foundation and that the upper part was made of wood. The way of thinking about the daily life of Dobrich is shown in the museum exhibit there. The way it's finished proves that there was a very high level of cultural advancement. The houses that were made by ancient people clearly indicates that they had free time at their disposal. They were also raising and cultivating plants and animals. I personally do not like the word ruins. These are not ruins. They are actually artifacts, treasures, traces and evidence left by one of the oldest cultures that ever existed in Europe. Artifacts have been found in the bigger island in the Duran Kulak Lake. There are six villages situated on the plot of land on the top of the island, one cheered over the other. This location is unique for Europe, in and of itself too. Every single house is extended on the large plot of 170 square meters. Each house was built using stones for the house foundation. The upper part were made of mud and clay as mortar, 
using the stripe technique is well known and well represented in India and China. The height of the houses was up to about 3 meters. Each house was divided into two rooms. The waterproof roof was made of two layers using the wattle and dab technique and sophisticated building material. We consider that the metal which was manufactured for and into ornaments such as jewelry was gold and that the ancients were digging it, panning or mining the gold in the area that currently called the Rodopi mountain. At the time there was numerous evidence showing us that metallurgy was very well developed. The tools were made mostly of copper. Archaeologists say that uh, uh, they face uh, abrupt uh, decrease of population of this area because they have hundreds of the sites of Stone Age but only a dozen of the Bronze Age. And they say that there was plenty of people who populated this area in Stone Age, but then they disappear somewhere. My viewpoint is that opposite happened. All the Stone Age settlement uh, was found, uh, established by people who escaped from the flood and uh, populated the steps of the area uh, before the shoreline uh, stabilized and they came back and rebuilt their houses. And because uh, there is no uh, uh, copper uh, sources in the area, they uh, had to use stone uh, tools, uh, flint, and uh, if we use dating by the uh, tools, by artifact, we consider them stone age, but actually it has nothing to do with the age. The Phoenicians were presumed to have come from the Sons of Sidon, who was the namesake for the ancient now submerged port city off the coast of Lebanon. In addition, the Thracians were also presumed to have come from Tyrus, a son of Japheth. Ancient historians even link the Ashkenaya region of the Ukraine with Ashkenaz, who was also a son of Japheth. The Cimmerians are linked with Gomer, another son of Japheth, known to the ancient Persians as Gemara. This seems to represent further evidence that the roots of the ancient people around the Old Black Sea are corroborated by the biblical accounts in Genesis. These earliest tribes of the Black Sea Basin were evidently already living there when the salt water from the then rising world ocean began to pour in. The Black Sea Basin created rivers outflowing back, such as the Don, Danube, and the Dnesta rivers. These rivers surged huge volumes of Ice Age runoff water back into the basin. It's when the Volga River was flowing as a torrent into the Caspian Sea. Many, many times its presence discharged, filling the Caspian Sea up to its outlet, which is the Manx Strait. Then that equivalent outflow would have poured into the Black Sea. The Black Sea would have risen to its outlet, and the same amount of outflow, and even perhaps more from the Black Sea rivers, from the, the uh, Danube rivers draining the ice of the Alps, all would have then poured out of the Black Sea, yes. And so the fact that we see the delta deposit of that river uh, south of the Kerch Strait, and we see its top of the delta, the subaqueous delta, at minus 50 meters, would say that that flood took the Black Sea Lake up to a level of about minus 30 meters. So its outlet at that time was about minus 30 meters. And then decades after this infilling had been occurring, Another temporary shoreline was established at negative 30 meters, but it is always at negative 30 meters. It doesn't vary from negative 20 to negative 50. So it indicates definitively that all this faulting, all this block faulting, to call these, cause these stair step block faults going down deeper and deeper along the continental shelf, uh, occurred at the end of the Ice Age and before this secondary shoreline was formed at negative 30 meters. So all this faulting, all this isostatic readjustment from the weight changes of the displaced water, the water moving in, caused all this faulting, all this catastrophic tectonic activity at the close of the Ice Age. Now, the argument's a little complicated, but when the ice caps melted in the global oceans, 
and they shrank, the weight of the ice caused the land that the ice caps sat on to rebound. We see this dramatically in Scandinavia. When the water pours in the ocean, the weight of the extra water in the oceans causes the ocean floor to sag. And essentially the plastic mantle deep beneath the crust moves from the areas where the water is added to the areas where the ice is removed. When the flood occurred in the Black Sea, you poured in 100 meters of water. The weight of that water then causes the margins around it to subside. Think about it, with warmer ocean waters at a greater evaporation rate, so you get your dense cloud cover for your snow blitzes in the extreme latitudes and much more rainfall in the middle latitudes. Ancient Egypt, the Old Kingdom Egypt, ancient Sumer, they were all much wetter. Think about it, those people couldn't live there today. They, they would not set up a grand civilization there in those, to those desert wastelands. It was much rainier there during the Ice Age because of dense cloud cover cover because of higher evaporation rates off the ocean because the oceans were warmer to cause the ice age. What causes the ice caps to come and go? We used to think it was caused by the amount of sunlight we call solar insulation that arrives at high latitudes in the northern hemisphere. But just a few years ago our young students here began to preach an opposite gospel that is actually caused by changes in the equatorial circulations. It's linked to such phenomena as the El Nino and El Nina. And it essentially has to do with heat transports from the equator northwards. And so the engine for climate change and the engine for, say, glacial meltdown may no longer be the amount of sunlight that forms at high latitude, but might actually be how the equatorial ocean behaves. And this is fantastic when your students <laughs> prove your ideas wrong. <laughs> now to end the Ice Age, uh, you know, paradoxically, it, it, it does seem strange. The Ice Age ended when the ocean tempers, temperatures had cooled enough to where there was less evaporation off of the oceans to cause less cloud cover. So you didn't have the dense cloud cover for the great snow blitz in the north and the much more rainfall in the central latitudes. So you, there was less cloud cover, so you had hot summers because the cloud cover was gone and the clouds in the summer shield the earth from the sun. So you had hot summers for a rapid snow melt and the winters became much colder because the cloud covers an insulator during the winter. Uh, Orion's and Pitman publication uh, came late 90s, but uh, Russians was uh, writing about the same uh, things of the forming of Black Sea much earlier and their publication of 1960s and earlier, and they even uh, uh, relate this event to the Dardanus flood from Greek mythology. So most of the legends they have is an oral tradition that came from previous uh, groups and uh, mostly through written uh, documents of Greek mythology. And uh, also it uh, related to the names the Greeks gave to the sea. So my viewpoint is that the, in the beginning there was a very powerful uh, flow of water from Black Sea to the uh, Aegean Sea, which was hard for the uh, salesmen to go against. But uh, after the Black Sea catastrophe, uh, Rainer Pittman talks about, t talk about uh, the strong uh, counter flow will, was replaced with a mild uh, flow that uh, helped Aegeans to come to the Black Sea, and the, it caused the, the change of the title of the name. Black Sea is anoxic. Its bottom waters are all poisonous. The interface between its oxygen-rich layer and its poisonous layer today is about 90 meters in the center of the Black Sea. When the anoxic level gets shallow enough that it gets into the level of sunlight, a photosynthetic bacteria appear that produce a purple pigmentation. This purple pigmentation is in the Black Sea cores which meant that the Black Sea poisonous water was very close to the sea surface and could have been exposed by big storms to poison 
the surrounding lands at the time of the early Sumerians in Mesopotamia. The fact remains that rainfall residue created poisonous chemical reactions in the Black Sea. These resulted in an unusual, hyperpigmented bacterial incursion in the sea. Salt water from the rapidly rising world ocean came in contact with the brackish water of the old Black Sea inland lake. Additional poisonous deposits were found clinging to the ancient ruins in Upper Mesopotamia. This clearly indicates also that the old Black Sea infilling at the end of the Ice Age was concurrent with the epoch of several ancient civilizations, Mesopotamians, Greeks, Thracians, Scythians, and Cimmerians. Yes, according to the evidence in ancient legends, ancient histories, uh, Sir James Fraser, uh, around 1900, traveled the world collecting ancient uh, uh, legends. And one of the legends which comes from Samothrace, which is an island just south of the Dardanelles, just south of the Black Sea, the legend says that Samothrace was part of the Greek mainland but then the sea level began to rise. The people were terrified and began to run to higher ground. And this is when Dardanus, who is the namesake of the Dardanelles, this is when he sailed and his sons, uh, Troas, founded Troy. And this, the, this Samothracian legend says that it was at this time that the Aegean Sea connected to the Black Sea. Now, Dardanus according to ancient Greek historians, lived around 1500 BC. He did not live at 8000 BC. So we've got to look hard at a much later end for the Ice Age, in historical times, at the end of the Old Bronze Age. There's a huge climate change across the world. The middle latitudes dried out. The ice packs disappeared. Sea levels rose at the time of Dardanus, which is, according to ancient Greek historians, around 1500 BC. Controversy swirls today around the Black Sea's ancient history and the reality of the flood. The flood is a hypothesis. It's a working hypothesis. We think it best explains the bulk of all the observations. But it's a hypothesis. It could be nullified tomorrow. So controversy has been extremely good for science and good for the Black Sea, and I relish controversy um, because it stimulates new thinking. Uh, controversy stimulates thinking at what we call out of the box, which certainly our model was out of the box. If someday some new evidence appears that nullifies the hypothesis, I'll sort of say, well, okay, I can sleep better now. And that's just great because we've learned, we've learned something. If the flood hypothesis holds up, it gives us an entirely new picture of our European origins. This is a new picture of the appearance of farming in Europe and where it came from and why it spread so far. In it would seem that this entire region, in fact, the second cradle of civilization, was just north of ancient Mesopotamia. The old Black Sea region was born immediately after the Ice Age, when it rained a lot more. Back when ancient humans built structures of sculpted and fitted megalithic blocks using wood timbers from the lush forest of the area. The post-Ice Age Black Sea region saw those ancient tribes smelting copper, gold, and silver, crafting fabulous works of art with their highly sophisticated tooling abilities. And all of this was before the great post-Ice Age sea level rise. It was back at the time of the ancient Greek kings, as mentioned by Plato himself, in his book Timaeus and Critias, when much of Greece, according to Plato, was submerged into the sea, when King Dardanus, whose namesake the Dardanelles Strait, now the waterway connecting the world ocean and the Black Sea, was settling his villagers in a countryside facing a new coastline, one which now holds mysteries of its own as it lies underwater, a long way out, 100 meters below the sea. Mm -hmm.